welcome. How do we handle our sense of injustice when our expectations have been violated? And how do we rebuild a sense of safety in ourselves and in the world after this has been destroyed? My name is Kate Woods, and today I welcome you to our panel discussion on moral injury. As a neurodivergent person who's fascinated both by systems and, um, and I have a strong sense of fairness and justice, the concept of moral injury is something that really speaks powerfully to me. This can occur in, at work, but also in many other settings as well. And when it happens, people say things like, I feel that the rug has been pulled out from under me. Or they may say, my whole world was turned upside down. And so this leads to a huge amount of disorientation, disbelief, a sense of betrayal. It can be a loss of trust in institutions and processes. So when we learn that we can't rely on each other or authority to hold the expectations that we've got, then we suffer a major loss of confidence and trust in people. Now, uh, we've got, pan we've got uh, three panelists today um, who I'd like to introduce now. We've got Abby Wilkinson. She's a survivor of 16 years in the workers' compensation system, and she's now living with chronic pain and the effects of botched surgery. And she's made it her mission to find out why insurers are not held to the same level of requirements that, um, sorry, why injured workers are not held to the same level of requirements that insurers are. And we have Linda, she's a very Gova and Camilla Roy woman who's been contributing to Aboriginal affairs since the 90s. She's been described as a prominent legal professional who fearlessly advocates for and on behalf of First Nations people and most particularly First Nations women. And we have David. David McBride is an Australian whistleblower and former British Army major and Australian Army lawyer. He's currently awaiting trial for making information on war crimes allegedly committed by Australian soldiers available to the ABC. Welcome to all of you. It's really good to have you here with me today. And I'd like to acknowledge that each of our panellists speaks from their lived experience. One thing that I think it's important to recognize is that it takes a great deal of inner work for people to process their experiences to the point that they can now share those stories with everyone from a position of strength. So welcome everyone today. Um, and uh, well, I would like to uh, start by this, uh, uh, talking about this, concept of um, normative expectations and um, what what it feels like uh, when those are, are betrayed. Abby, should we start with you? Um, because you um, you were dealing with a system that exists uh, first and foremost to take care of people and that wasn't your experience at all. Yes, I can't speak on my actual experience within workers' compensation due to legal requirements. Oh, However, my experience extended um, outside of that and I had to rely on the State Insurance Regulatory Authority, who is the overseer of the industry, uh, to assist me. Um, Betrayal is probably a really um, diluted version of what I experienced with, with CIRA. I had no choice but to put my trust in them. Uh, they celebrate themselves as being there to help injured workers and to assist people in when they have issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, what I experienced was they took my situation they took action, which eventually took action after trying to tell me they had no authority. Uh, that action resulted in uh, them issuing civil penalties, which was the first time in the history of the workers' compensation scheme that that had ever been done. Um, 
And the result of that was them standing up in parliamentary inquiries, uh, puffing their chests out as look at us, we're looking after people, we're doing what's right. Uh, all the while they uh, abandoned me. They didn't acknowledge what I'd been through to be able to help them to administer those fines. Um, from the time I started with CIRA to when the fines were applied, there is a very big shift on their website of how they approached injured workers. So it was very obvious that my experience triggered change within the organisation. However, we're five years on, I haven't had an apology. I haven't had any recognition of what my experience was that led them to be able to do that. I've been through two investigations with them. The second one was essentially to find out how to assist me, like compensate me, a suitable apology. And all they did was re-traumatize me. Mm. They abused their power and they continue to do that. So uh, that, was, that was a feeling then of um, that it was performative, performative change, uh, wanting to be seen to be doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess a way to illustrate that is partway through the first investigation, I was told by somebody who worked for CIRA that, well, it's taking some time because we're using parts of the legislation we've never used before. Now, that part of the legislation was to protect injured workers. They never, never in their existence attempted to protect an injured worker prior to that. So... It wasn't an easy process. It wasn't a process of, well, here's my complaint. Okay, these are the next steps. I had to document dump. I had to, you know, reach out to all of the people I could find in CIRA and basically just have a tantrum. I guess that's what they would consider it to get attention when it should have been something that was looked at immediately. And how did you, how did you protect yourself while you were going through this process because you've got you've got people essentially that they're not reinforcing your point of view they're actually pushing back on you yes. and you're having to con constantly challenge them so how do you manage to keep going in those circumstances um I'm a fairly stubborn person by nature <laughs> um but the whole experience has really made me question authority figures mm -hmm. because I don't trust anybody now which is, is very difficult. But during the, the, in the process, I guess, my protection was my family. They kept me going. Um, and because I did all of this by myself without legal representation, mm. I, I got Sarah to mediation without any legal representation. Um, it was difficult, but I really had to focus on the fact that I wasn't doing this just for myself. I was doing it for all the injured workers yeah. who didn't have the confidence, the ability or the resources to be able to hold somebody like Sarah to account. Mm -hmm. um, and, and David, this would be a, 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 a circumstance that was very similar for you as, as well, of course, is that when you, when you raise an issue and you expect that it's going to be handled appropriately, and yet that isn't the experience that you've got, even though and you're, you're um, escalating an issue because that's the right thing to do. But then the response is completely different. What's that like? Yeah, no. Um, hearing uh, the previous speaker talk, it, it sends shivers up my spine. You could, you could substitute your institution to my own it's exactly the same but uh, but but still very confronting because who would have thought an institution that is meant to be doing exactly could be possibly doing the opposite uh and not only that um and for people that work in the area as we do it's particularly galling that they at the same time they're pumping out some sort of bogus good news message um, ads on, you know, TV brochures that are saying how, how, how good they are and what they do. Now that is, it's creepy. It's good for me a couple of years ago to be too confronting for me to hear messages like this, but it's good now because you realize it's like water in the desert to realize you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. It is a sickness, which is, uh, it's more than just, um, 
one-offs. And that's why it's good we're doing things like this because you can't keep whack-a-mole of oh, this organisation, this organisation. It's rife and it's psychology. It's interesting to think how many people are kind of living a lie. You know, they're doctors who are killing people. There are soldiers who are actually, you know, committing war generals who are saying one thing and doing another. Uh, I was quite surprised by that. And I came from quite an idealistic background and I was really quite shocked how many people who look like us, who talk like us, but who are not like us. And that that's, hits you hard. Uh, and especially, um, we do need to band together because as I said, the, the, way, the way that they get away with this is just like, it's a one-off thing. It's very hard to investigate these things. It's very, it takes a long time. People get exhausted and they can, it, but it's, it's pretty rife within so many institutions. And you wonder, a lot of it's got to do with psychology, as I said, and, and the idea that once you start working for an institution, you, you have to make a fight or flight decision. If someone says there's an issue, you, you don't know which way to go, you go the easiest way, and then you just suddenly decide you're going to fight them rather than um, uh, take it up. And then the, the harder they fight, the harder you fight back. Uh, but it's uh, one of the things that struck me is uh, they used to tell us at school, I used to scoff at all this sort of uh, Greek, ancient Greek uh, philosophy, but they used to say, know thyself and uh, to thine own self be true. And I'd be like, oh, but one of the things, one of the six sort of uh, principles was most men are bad. And I wouldn't afford that, but you do realise that there is a lot of, a large percentage of people uh, are not that good. And they're, um, it, it, we need to work out about doing that because a lot of people are happy to, to put out a front that they are doing the right thing, but they must know it in their heart that they're not actually, because it's too it's too much of a coincidence to hear these stories. Anyway, I'll hand over to somebody else. Well, I, I'd just like to go back to something you, you, you said there, because I think it's so true. It's something that uh, a lot of us will relate to is that quite often you can divide your life into like before this happened and after this happened and then it comes in that there's this knowledge but once you've got this knowledge you're never the same again and so as you said David you know there's most people um and they they may think differently because they haven't had that experience so it's like there's this this group like you said you 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 believe that you're not the only one but there's still an awful lot of people out there that haven't experienced these things that can't necessarily understand uh, these types of experiences. So Linda, what, how do you handle or, you know, how do we communicate, I guess, with the rest of the population or, or how do you kind of get the word out to, to help people understand? Do you think they'll listen? Because well, I, I guess that that's the, that's the, the question, isn't it? So, yeah. Will they? Or, or do you have to? Individually, I think we've done a lot of talking, a lot of jumping up and down. We've become very angry, very publicly. And yet, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins who are currently in the spotlight and being applauded for their anger and their courage and their uh, sort of... Um, uh, unquestioning uh, point of view when they say someone needs to be held to account. Um, but first women, black women have been doing that since 1788. And all we get is told that we're an angry black woman, we should sit down and shut up and get over it. And it's not unlike what we're hearing here from Abby and um, David, it's just, it's exactly the same. Mm. Um, it's all in your head. And for women, um, Mr. McBride, I'm sorry, but it, it is worse for women because we're told that we're hysterical. Um, I, I don't believe I've ever heard a gentleman referred to as being hysterical. Um, having said that, I have no doubt they'll have other labels for you. And, you know, the thing is, we've all um, come through a system um, which we have 
worked and given part of ourselves to and they have essentially destroyed um, our goodness in the way that we look at those things. I, um, as a young Aboriginal girl, I didn't didn't think about going to uni. That wasn't on, on my radar. It wasn't for people like me. It wasn't for families like mine. Um, it wasn't until I was 31 that I was working in the Aboriginal legal service and um, one of the barristers there said, oh, you've got a bit of a knack for this. Maybe you should study. So looking back way back then, um, and then <laughs> I look at where I am now, um, I, I played the game. I played the game by their rules. I got educated. I earned a living. You know, I, I did well. And the first seven years in the Department of Justice, I was making a difference. As, as um, you know, crazy as that sounds. And it's such a line that people go, oh, yes, I just want to make a difference. Um, the difference was made to me, I'm afraid. And um, you're right. We, we come out the other side and we are completely different. And things that we took for granted, we are now very suspicious of and very critical about and apply a intensely critical mind. And I would never have thought myself to be so tough. Um, and, and I say that not in a, in a courage context, but in a no nonsense context, it's like, you know, the bullshit's over. Don't try and bullshit me now. I'm 53. <laughs> I'm not going to take your bullshit. You know, I don't have to. I, I've, I've got your scars and I wear them well. And, you know, more for you. However, if you had said to me when I was in the middle of all the craziness that I experienced, what are you going to do? I don't know whether I was capable of telling you that. I, w I, don't, e I don't even recall... Um, one day from the next, they all m melted into a period of time. And yeah, okay, I came out the other side swinging. But that was because I had a couple of uh, very important things happen. And I didn't realize how important they were. And I didn't make a conscious choice to come out swinging. Um, it just seems to have happened that way but again I feel I have an obligation to call uh, government departments to account um, particularly the justice department I studied for years to get a law degree to make a difference to understand the rules to play the game and to play it properly and to be told right back in the very beginning, I was never going to amount to much. And then to go through and, and be quite satisfied with myself that I had actually done something that people didn't think I was capable of. And then to have that glass door slammed in my face repeatedly by people I knew and had worked with very closely for a long period of time and they did that while I was in the room only I didn't realize what was going on 12 months later I was officially advised there was an investigation and I was horrified what about and then it became very clear what it was about and I was devastated I had n no understanding whatsoever as to what thing I had done or what number of things I had done for my colleagues and people I respected to think so poorly of me. And for a long period of time, it's been a secret. So that was in 2012. Now, I went through the anti-discrimination process. I went through... Um, the Supreme Court having uh, the, the Anti-Discrimination Commission's um, decision reviewed. Um, and I came out the other side with nothing, nothing but a big bill because I was out of time. I was, first of all, even if I um, wasn't unwell, 
I wouldn't have been in time by the time I found out. Because what went on, it was there was 12 months before they even told me. And I had this experience of my colleagues treating me poorly and denying me basic things. And I just thought, oh, look, it's not about me. They're just having a bad day. This is a crazy area to work in sometimes. And that's what I was telling myself. And those people know who they are. And you know what? The story now, unfortunately for them, is on the public record. And I am not right required to be silent. I do not have any non-disclosure agreements in place. Mm. And you know what? It's the truth. So defamation does not apply. But through that period, you know, I was unwell. I, they, they relocated me four hours from home. So that was my travel day, four hours. And then I undertook six right to information searches over a period of time to try and work out what the hell had gone on and why, because they wouldn't tell me. And I got those. They sent me to five different psychiatrists in 10 months. And they all said, Linda's really angry. Lin Linda can't work for you anymore. She's really angry because the public service and the servants there did not do their job. The executives of the Department of Justice did not do their jobs. The magistrate did not do her job. The commission, whilst they may have done their job, they were... Um, shackled by the legislation that is not representative of reality. So I, I'm well past thinking that this is my fault because I know it's not my fault. But you know what? There was a time where I thought I should just end it all, you know, be, be easier. And the only thing that kept me going was my son because I could not tell my dad for months and months and months. I was so horrified and embarrassed. So at that, at that point, what, what kept you going? I think the fact that I was uh, a young Aboriginal girl from the country, raised mm -hmm. on a farm. Um, was all sorts of uh, all sorts of I ticked all sorts of diversity boxes, um, and the people that hold my heart still now are those grassroots people, mm. and I know that this stuff happens. Aboriginal women everywhere, constantly, and they have no voice, and they are not. They have not ever realized the opportunities that I have. Now, I don't say that those opportunities have been fantastic because they've obviously come with a price but um, and lots of hard work. But it's because I'm fairer that I've been able to realize those. And I know that Aboriginal women out there do not have someone advocating for them. They do not have someone who is a lawyer who comes from grassroots, who's been damaged by the system. And for whatever reason, and I think it's, I'm not a religious person, I'm a cultural person, but there's obviously something at play here. And I'd like to think it's my ancestors because something's kicking me along because it's, it's not me. It, mm, it's not a conscious thing. So I and I'd just like to go back to uh, what we were talking before about um, time frames because I think one of uh, one of one of the things that seems to cause to make the the moral injury even worse is the there's there's quite an interminable um, distance and in, in like there's, there's a, a couple of things that that seem to be very common to uh, to everyone's experience. And one is the, there's, there's like a nightmare phase that is, it sort of begins with, oh, hang on a second, things don't seem quite right. 
uh, or you know people aren't responding to me in the right way and then and then there's this period of time where you start to go oh no this this is not on the right track but during this point you're still kind of hoping that everything is going to be all right you still you still and I heard I heard some people saying this um through sort of different discussions here you're still hoping that people are going to do the right thing and and making explanations and thinking oh maybe it's this or maybe it's that uh, so I just want to get back to that because that is one of the 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 parts of the nightmare that I think is the most painful so uh, Abby you you're nodding there. So, <laughs> so the when, that you, too. when you spoke about, you know, hoping that they'll do the right mm. thing, I went back for a second helping of Sarah. Mm. I lived the first investigation and there was an outcome. And I went back to say, okay, so you've got your outcome. Where's my outcome? And I had government minister. He requested, personally requested the investigation. So to me, yeah, okay, I feel like they're taking this seriously. Then an investigator was appointed. The whole thing, the whole process felt like, yes, we value what you've been through and we really want to help you. But the whole time, they were just causing more and more damage. They betrayed my trust twice. Um, they, I mean, the embarrassment and shame I felt when everything fell over at the mediation I, I couldn't get out of bed. Mm. It took a very long time to realize that wasn't me. Mm. I felt like I looked like a fool, but mm. I was, I fought as hard as I could and there's no shame in that. No. Because what, what's your aim in that, you know, from a, um, from a compassionate perspective you when you're thinking about those are the workers who are in the system and you know what 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 were you thinking when you're um putting yourself through that what's your what's your end goal there yes yeah, so i guess what kept me pushing through was that there was going to be change made and it was mm. the little glimmers of change that i saw that kept me going mm. Um, I obviously, uh, through my experience, had spoken to a lot of injured workers who they were at the end, they were ready to give up. Um, I'm very big on if there's legislation for one person, then there's legislation for all parties involved. Um, but when you're in the thick of being an injured worker, you're dealing with physical pain, emotional pain, the, the realisation that your life is not yours anymore. And you can't always see through that to make change. And I think with, dare I touch on COVID, um, I came to the realisation probably six months into 2020 that I had been trained for COVID from <laughs> being an injured worker. And mm. then as that progressed, our society had to rely on the government to make key decisions, to take actions to protect us all. And that didn't always happen. Um, a lot of people felt let down by the government and rightly or wrongly, all I could think was now, you know, how it feels. Isn't, I, it, isn't it funny? I, I, um, I, I'm with you on this going back for a second whack, you know, um, because I'd like to think that, um, despite my anger, I'm a whole lot smarter and a whole lot more considered now and a whole lot less tolerant, so um, I, I might be, you know, the tough old bitch um, that, that they didn't want to come across. But I, I, in my heart of hearts, I would really like to see some evidence of those people who perpetrated the wrong to say sorry yeah. to me. Not publicly, just to say, hey, that was shocking. We, we got that so wrong. Instead of putting up this front or she's in trouble, you know, she is trouble. Yeah. And don't go near her because she's like a cancer. Well, just to speak to that, it's recently come to light that I have been black banned 
by Sarah. <gasps> they will not engage in correspondence with me. They will not essentially acknowledge my existence, which, you know, that sucks. But on the flip side, taken a little bit of comfort in the fact that I've got some pretty high powered executives and CEOs scared of my letters. You know, this all could have been avoided if you had taken the right course of action, held up your end of the bargain, followed through with your promises, your commitments, and your you know, and procedures. That's right. Like they expected me to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I guess that speaks to again, Kate, of how we, we survive. It's those little moments where you can go, huh? Yeah. I got them as much as they think they got me. And that's what I'd like to go back to discussing when, when COVID hit, because that was quite, this is a, a, a common thing that I've heard from people who have experienced already a great deal of adversity with life shattering consequences. It was this feeling of now everyone else is starting to understand a little bit more and having to deal with something on, on, a, on a much bigger scale. So David, what was that like for you when, when COVID sort of started to hit and people are having those sorts of experiences and, and you, um, you're already dealing with something um, so major yourself? Oh, you're on mute then. My dogs were barking. Um, All right. Yeah, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of identification. I've been writing notes about all the things I want to speak about. But we right. Know, <laughs> um, COVID was funny. I know it's a typical subject, but I, I guess like the other speakers were said, and uh, I, uh, you know, I got vaccinated, and like everybody else, it was mandatory. But I did, I, I did have to bite my tongue a lot. What were like, because you would just stop myself saying, don't, you know, to people, don't think just because the government says something um, that it's necessarily true. <laughs> and you've, you've been through that all, it's in the papers and it's necessarily true, you know. If you've been through the sort of things we've been through, we know that that's not necessarily, you know, that you have to, uh, things are more complex and that, you know, uh, there is, there is scope. I mean, for example, for, in my case, in Afghanistan, um, uh, the public didn't know the truth about what was going on in Afghanistan for 20 years. It came out when the whole thing kind of collapsed. But it, it, that was like, in some ways, the, apart from the insiders, the best kept secret in the world, that it was, that it was going well when it wasn't going well. Um, so you it, it you and um, uh, it, it was touched on uh, before to say you you have to be strong in yourself. Linda was saying, I mean, you you won't necessarily ever get recognition, mm. um, and uh, that was one of the things I identified with Linda when I was getting treated for post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't from fighting the Taliban, it was from fighting my own organisation. <laughs> The, yeah. um, the, the doctor, the psychiatrist said um, to my wife, in, in the presence of my wife and my kids, which annoyed me, she said, he will never be the same. And I was really angry. And I was, because I thought, well, okay, I will never be the same, but I'm better. You know, mm. I, I'm in some ways, I'm stronger, a bit like you get turned into a superhero, getting bitten by a spider. I might not have been the same kind of nice guy that took everything at face value. But as Linda said, I was tougher, I was harder, um, maybe more focused on justice, um, different, but not worse by any means. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk about psychiatry. This is a, this is a story which you, the people in this room will understand, but no one else would, would believe. Uh, and they sent me to a psychiatrist. Um, I didn't get to choose. And the psychiatrist, gaslit me to try to say you only believe all this stuff because you know you're in, you're you talk about they use things on you but they, they use hysterical on you because they think it might work but it's not you know there are weapons as you said there, there are weapons with me because I come from a sort of blue collar I mean a white collar background and professionals they said oh you just have this incredible sense of entitlement 
And and the only reason you think everything is corrupt in defence is because, you know, you didn't get your way and you always get your way in life. Mm. And this, and, and this, um, this psychiatrist, yeah, he tried to be, and because he was a psychiatrist, I didn't totally rule him out. And, and it, was, it wasn't until later that I found out that the Australian tax office had a similar program, which they'd learned from the Americans, of course, when they, they, they classify us as high conflict individuals. Oh. They try and they've got a, they've got a system. It's a, and it's an actual program with a PowerPoint and a manual how to deal with high conflict individuals. And they try to post you to an unpopular posting. There's all these things they try and do. And one of them is to send them to a psychiatrist um, to try to say, look, it's all in your own head. And the, the tax office got caught out doing it. Um, it's quite, you know, it's quite astounding. And you wonder why we get angry. I mean, uh, uh, it's pretty bad. And I'll hand over to someone else, but it, that, that admitting people, people admitting that they may have been wrong is one of the hard things because they, people, it will never happen. People said, "What a dig!" And that that would have solved my issues from the beginning. If the senior leadership of the defence force had said, "Look, we see your point. Uh, it was a war. We fudged figures. We covered up. You know, we 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 can see that we overextended the false PR messages. You know, out of fear of losing or something. That would have been enough for me." But they didn't want to take a backward step. It was just a uh, fight to the bitter end. And that is one of the interesting psych psychology bits is that, is that the fact that people um, uh, won't admit they're wrong. And, and they tried to give me a, a, a sort of restructured trip back to work. Um, what Abby was saying rung true with me too. And uh, uh, yeah, I went back to work and I was trying to put everything behind me. And I was talking about millions, probably 50 million, $100 million of, of money that had been wasted in Florida. And when I got back to work, they started chasing me for, for a, um, a $50 cab charge, you know, which, which had been sort of a, clearly, you know, they, I didn't have the receipt, but it was clearly used on a cab, et cetera. And there, there, was, there was no possibility of any fraud. And that just stuff just winds you up and you're saying, you, you know, you haven't looked into all these major things and now you're going to go in the, uh, over something ridiculous. Um, yeah, so it's, it is hard to go back to work and it is, you're constantly confronted. If you don't get a full settlement, you're constantly confronted with hypocrisy. Um, so and, uh, it's, it's that morality of mind. It's what, we've, what we're taught. We're taught to trust. We're taught to believe. We're conditioned that um, you know they'll they'll do the right thing for us, and and they're they're a higher level lot of beings that um, you know wouldn't possibly do the wrong thing. So if if they're at that level, uh, it's obviously got to be us that's wrong. You know, it's it's obviously got to be be me that's got it all back to front. Um, but when when it's not me, and then they 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 come after you with that new set of allegations. Uh, for me, it was releasing confidential information that belonged to the public service to the public. When in fact, it was all over their their website. <laughs> and I'm thinking, go back and have a look at your website. Um, no, no. But not only did they do that, they they wanted me to engage with the ethical standards fellow who had damaged me first time round. And I said, mm -mm, not doing that. So then they um, threatened to medically retire me because I, yeah, I, I obviously wasn't, wasn't going back. So um, rightly or wrongly, cleverly or otherwise, I resigned. And I just thought, you know what? I should have actually let them medically retire me um, because I was never gonna work for them again anyway. However, it was that one shred of dignity that I had the opportunity to sort of um, um, satisfy my morality of heart that I was right and I left them because they're the bad guys. Um, and uh, now, however, um, they can't escape me because I have, I, I took some time away from the legal profession. I, I, when the matter was going to the Supreme Court, I 
I just resigned from the Queensland Law Society. I resigned as a result of that from the Law Council of Australia. I stopped doing all sorts of things and said, I'm not doing that because I've got some other things going on in my life which are um, not helpful to that. Um, I'm still unsure whether any of those people have any concept of, of what those things were. Um, but I have, have come back in, in, in this reinvented version of Linda, which I think they're going to really wish that they had just let the, you know, the first Linda exist properly and, um, be more honest about things and resolve things because I was only ever there. And my thinking was that we were all only there to change things that weren't working very well for Aboriginal people in the justice system. Um, but clearly that wasn't on the agenda. So let's, and, and let's talk about then. So when, when, um, we first start like raising these issues, and David, you you touched on this um, just now. It's why why do you think it is that it's it's pathologized to the person that's raising the issues in the first place, and they're saying, oh, it's it's with the individual, and therefore you have to go and have treatment because of it's 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 all with you, um, but actually it's 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 the system so you know why why do we think it is why do they keep throwing <laughs> throwing treatment it's, it's at the individual that, expecting that will make a difference it's, it's funny that you say that because they do say that to us they do say mm. it's us but behind the scenes they're moving people sideways in the public service they don't uh. get that they just get moved sideways and in my situation they replace these white women with black men into these uh positions of seniority as if that was going to fix it they'd already been assimilated into the public service way of thinking and doing um it's 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 not that they're not towing the line for the public service it's the fact that the public service system itself um is broken and it's so lucrative for those individuals that are at those high levels really why would they why would they want to accept our version as true? It's not cost effective. You know, no, I, that's, no. I kind no, of feel no. like that was the situation with me that if Sarah ag acknowledged what I'd been through, what actions they took, and then took steps to apologize and recorrect my experience to the best of their ability, that was Pandora's box because I'm not an anomaly. My case was not an anomaly. I've not spoken to anybody on workers' compensation ever who's loved it or had a great experience. I mean, that's over there, but I've also not come across anybody who's dealt with Sarah and gone, well, thank, thanks. I'm so grateful that they were there to help me out. I've never had that feedback from anybody. They, I mean, they exist at the taxpayer's expense they exist in this little political bubble yep. where they are all just um, beefing out their own careers, essentially. Uh, it's, you know, a former CEO of CIRA was awarded a public service medal. <laughs> well, how about, Mrs. Public Service Medal, you share with the people what you've done to the injured workers? Because that's not a public service. Public service doesn't exist in this category. It extends to how you treat the public. And it seems there's a growing pattern of everybody in society being treated worse and worse. And that's going to have such a long-term effect on individuals. What happens when essentially we all are carrying some form of moral injury? Because as you say, we've been raised to trust been raised that there are good people and people will help you but when that becomes less and less common it's just going to erode the fabric of society you know the honesty that comes with um owning the moral injury that's perpetrated against individuals and lots of us is actually a very courageous thing to do and i don't think 
that we have individuals in our public service agencies that have that courage. Um, it's a closed shop. Yeah, look, I, I would agree with that. And I'll chime in and I'm glad you raised it. I mean, that the elephant in the room is that, as you said, and, and it needs a brave person to say it, the public service is broken. And, and like in the, the Secretary of Defence got paid 900 grand a year. And it went up in my time, it went from 400 to 900 in the space of a few years. Now that wasn't because they did a good job for the Australian people. That was because they knew where the bodies were buried and they kept their mouths shut. Yeah, so as if someone who gets paid nine hundred dollars, nine hundred thousand a year is going to accept someone making a complaint that his department is rotten. You know, they're not going to give up their Mercedes Benz and their big house and and all the, you know, it 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 it, it, it is us versus them and and everything else is just window dressing and. Um, you're right, we need to band together to take it on. It's good, to, uh, as I said about myself, uh, you know, we've been hardened in this in this uh, kiln and we've come out ready to, to, to fight. Yeah, right? you know, we're stronger. It's great to hear that, uh, the two of you, um, Abby and Linda, talk. It's exactly the same. They, it, it, but it, they were a bit wrong because I think because they know right from the beginning that they were wrong and they, they are really just trying to cover up uh, there's no sense of them going, oh, well, maybe we're in the wrong here. They, they just, they, we have discovered the secret <laughs> that they are, that they're, they're rubbish and they don't want anyone else to find out, you know. And what's really disheartening is the fact that um, I, I, being a work in progress and I don't ever think I'm going to be recovered from this, I think... Um, being the work in progress that I am and being very careful and strategic and considered about what I do and who I do that with now, it's really quiet and it, it's really quite a, an interesting thing that I can say to you. I still have a, a very minute space in my heart and in my mind where I'm waiting for one of the good guys to, who are at that senior level to actually genuinely and authentically say to me, that was no good. That was Beware of the sheep in, uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing. That's all I can say. My experience would be that the good guys who make that approach, they're usually not. They're not <laughs> making an approach for you. They're making an approach for them. It's happened to me recently fact finding just digging in just to see where i'm at where other people are at it's i think it's it's just a an institutionalized thing now that to work for the public service is i can't even think of the right words to describe it but they're not there for the public no it's a hollywood movie thing. they're the bad guys yeah, <laughs> yeah. But if you ask them, it's not a us and you situation. We're, yeah, yeah. we're with it you. It totally is. It totally yeah. is. Yeah. So who, who's, who's the perpetrator then? Who do we regard as the perpetrator? The people behind the creation and the maintenance and the rolling out and the continuation of the system or the players within it or all of the above? Well, I think they all need to take responsibility. I mean, if I was to sit here and abuse you now, so for, no, for no reason, I've just decided that I don't like you and I'm going to abuse you and then I walk away scot-free. I need to take ownership of that. That's not your fault. Yeah. But when do you means, think their moral injury is going to kick in? Well, that's what I was I just about right to say. <laughs> the individuals that make up this thing that we're dealing with all bring their own respective trauma with them. I think... There, there was a point maybe 10, 15 years ago where red tape became the only way to do everything. Everything had red tape around it. There was a policy for opening the front door, a policy for photocopying. Strip away the policies and go back to human interaction and human connection. There shouldn't be a policy for conducting a morning tea. Like, stop, stop listing every action that should be taken because then when people step outside of that they don't know how to respond mm -hmm. and if they're handed a situation that requires thinking out of the square they they just can't do it and everything that's that, is 
that's that morality upfront stuff, the, the owning it, the, the, all of those sorts of things, the, the keeping communities together the, rather than actually doing that on a human level, they're doing that on a systems level sure. that is modified to suit. But what they're doing, in fact, is creating all these rules that um, unless you get every single element in the pile of rules right, the whole thing falls over. And I guess the, the other take on that is that the rules that they have stacked up are only for them. Mm -hmm. Then they have a set of rules for us. Mm -hmm. Now, when those rules meet up in the middle, there's going to be overlay. There's going to be things that have been missed. Like Sarah expected me to act in a particular way, yet I couldn't expect the same of them. It's so his. Sorry, I'm gonna sorry. I'm gonna jump in there, Kate, That's because fine. we're nearly up for time. Oh, so um, last comment, perhaps you could ask for everyone. Yep, yeah. quick comment. Oh yeah. So uh, if we can if we can just go around, we'll start with you, Linda, and if for your final thoughts. My final thoughts. Uh, well, this is this is a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. Um, I'm expecting to be hit with a cost order. For, uh, for my troubles uh, and I will see how that goes but it, I won't go down <laughs> quietly but as far as the moral injury stuff goes there are so many elements to it and then you add the transparency which you look through as an Indigenous person as a First Nations person and it's compounded absolutely compounded and exacerbated by the white elite making out they're doing the right thing and they're not and unfortunately my old people would have said you should have known that from the beginning linda so so it's about it so it's about maintaining your momentum and and but at the same time you're living with that injustice on a daily basis that and i have a care less attitude yeah. toward it now because I know I don't tell lies so you know bring it on yeah maintaining that that moral compass yep yeah and that's David all that's all I've got at the end of the mm. day that's the only thing I've got left because mm. my that's reputation's in shatters my career I have to rebuild from nothing again um so I just have to believe that, you know, being the honest one will get me through ultimately. Okay, and and David, yes, it's, you, uh, that? you have to your own conscience, uh, uh, as Linda and Abby have said, is the most important thing. You're never going to get uh, everything you need outside. I I said that. A couple of years ago, when I was put on trial, I said, I bet the judge will probably find me, acquit me, but at the end of the day, it's my own conscience that I'm most worried about. Uh, I'm happy with that. I don't think I'm a work in progress and that I'm not damaged. I'm in some, I'm, un, I'm luckier than others in that you know, I go, you know, I'm facing the prospect of prison, and in some ways, that's some sort of that gives me some. Uh, I'm doing something rather than just, uh, in fact, it's easier than before I was charged because um, now there is some sort of resolution and, and in some ways going to prison with my head held up high gives me some sort of satisfaction because uh, I can, it, it really has, it's a piece of hard evidence that I stood up, uh, I was counted and, um, and my conscience is quite clear. And I know, uh, talking about with uh, Abby, I think mentioned it. I mean, it, it, I know it, it. I know it bothers them, um, especially if, if I am proud of what I've done. It bothers my opponents. Uh, I've got a lot of support now. I don't really feel like I'm, 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 I'm carrying a personal injury. There's a fine line between injury and anger. I still have anger, um, as. Uh, as Abby and Linda do anger against the organisation, I think it's a kind of righteous anger. Uh, and I, um, yeah, but luckily I have a vehicle to do something about it. I've got a platform. Uh, and at the, at, at the end of the day, it's about improving the government. It's about improving conditions. And as long as you keep on focusing 
on those outcomes, you never need to uh, you feel too sorry for yourself and that you can say, well, I've still got a mission I need uh, to carry out. And, um, and, and that's an important focus that, that keeps your head up. Thank you. And Abby, you also know what it's like to stand up and, and be counted. And um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, I've, I'm at a really strange stage of probably being apathetic towards the whole thing. I have had the dark days, the much like, you know, Linda, I, I will say the only reason I'm still alive is because of my two children. Mm. I figured my husband would move on as awful as that sounds. I, he's a grown up, he could process and move on, but I would, I could, my two children kept me here. Mm. That was in my very dark time. But now I guess I see it as I waited for Sarah to tell everybody what had happened in their investigation. And it dawned on me recently that why am I waiting for them? I've got it all. I was there. I've got the receipts. I've got the tea to pour as, you know, the, <laughs> is the way to say it. Um, I don't need to wait for them to come out and say, this is what happens. So once I came to that realization, I, I felt a little bit stronger. I mean, mm. I consider myself a work in progress as humans. To me, we all are a work in progress. We never know what life's going to throw at us. But as far as the, the moral injury side of it, I'm working through the shame and the embarrassment. And I'm finding, finding the light in the crevices of they black banned me. I got to them. They went to mediation with me. The way what happened after that was not in my control. There were forces at play that I had no control over I can't own that so I guess I came up with the mantra that I wouldn't let a bad day turn into a bad week turn into a bad month so I allow myself to have bad days I allow myself to to cry and throw rocks at the sun but they are becoming few and like further and further apart I guess I'm just fortified in the strength that I'm not alone that you know, what I went through compared to like for you, David, with the, you know, the, the trial and the possibility of prison time, my situation was entirely different to that. And same with yours, Linda, but at, we all come together having experienced different things, but suffering the same effects. I think there's a book, think, yeah, hey, maybe it's, maybe it's the second book to the moral injury, dirty work thing. Maybe it's the, the dirty work, the reality. Yeah. <laughs> we could make a, a reality TV show with it, with different chapters, um, with the different stories. Um, and uh, you know, it, it certainly needs to be out there. And I, I am past wearing the shame. Mm. I, when I tell the story now, it's very cut and dried. It's very um, no nonsense. And it's it's on the public record. I encourage people. They say, oh, well, we won't say anything. I said, look, I don't care if you do. It's on the public record. Google my name. Yeah. Find it. And then, and then go, you know, to other places. You'll find it. I don't need to tell you. I'm not embarrassed. I have nothing to be embarrassed about. I am not immoral. That's right. And yeah, and on shame, you know, they say that shame dissipates when stories are told in safe places. So I, I'd just like to thank all of you today for being so generous with your stories, so generous with your time and your insights. And I hope that anyone that's listening to this who's been in situations like this that that recognize any of these stories themselves can see that they aren't alone and that there are people who've been through this and that strength after difficult times is possible so thank you very much thank you so much thank you thank you